Good morning. Uh, I'm David Burton, a senior fellow in economic policy here at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, our event today is Let Entrepreneurs Raise Capital Using Finders and Private Placement Brokers. And let me take a second to explain the basic structure of this event and then uh, say a few words about finders and then I'll introduce the congressman. Uh, basically, we're going to have Congressman Bud speak for a while, take a couple questions, but he is time constrained and we'll have to leave relatively quickly. And then we're going to have a panel consisting of three panelists who uh, will give presentations and then be available for uh, questions from the audience. Let me take just one second and explain a little bit about finders and why they matter. A finder is a person who is paid to assist a small business owner to find capital. It can be someone who's in the business of being a finder, which these days we typically call private placement brokers, but it can also be a Main Street small business colleague. So if I'm seeking to raise capital for a new venture, I might say to you that I'm trying to do so and I'll give you 2% if you make an introduction to an investor who ultimately invests. And <clears throat> that, of course, helps people find capital because it can be in their financial interest to find uh, or make the introductions uh, that result in an investment. About almost 18 years ago now, the SEC created a huge regulatory cloud surrounding the use of finders and private placement brokers. Prior to that, if all you did was make introductions, you were fine. But the SEC yanked the no action letters that said that using finders and private placement brokers that simply made introductions was fine. And then they gave a bunch of speeches saying that, in effect, finders should be treated the same as Merrill Lynch and regulated as broker-dealers and have to register as broker-dealers. But they never actually put out rules saying when finders are OK and when they aren't. So we've been in this sort of regulatory cloud for nearly 20 years. Now, finders are potentially very important in the parts of this country where people uh, earning over $300,000 a year or who don't have a net worth of a million dollars are un uncommon. Uh, an accredited investor able to invest in Regulation D offerings has to have a joint income of over $300,000 or a residence exclusive net worth of more than a million dollars or be a financial institution. Um, in New York or Washington or San Francisco, those kind of people are fairly common. There's a lot of them. In North Carolina, they're less common. Uh, so finders can play an important role. Um, and the Unlocking Capital for Small Business Act introduced by Representative Budd will help address these problems. Now let me take a second and introduce the congressman. And then I'll sit down because I'm sure you're more interested in listening to him than me. Representative Budd is a member of the U.S. House of Representatives representing North Carolina's 13th District, located roughly between Winston-Salem and Charlotte, and includes Greensboro. He grew up on a cattle and commercial chicken farm in Davie County, and he still lives in Davie County with his family. He is in his first term of office, having been elected in 2016. Uh, prior to being elected, he was a small business person, and his business interests have included a maintenance landscaping and janitorial service company and a gun shop. He currently serves on the House Financial Services Committee, including the Capital Markets Subcommittee. And uh, in his uh, educational background, he has a BS from Appalachian State University in Business, an MBA from Wake Forest University, and a Master's in Leadership from the Dallas Theological Seminary. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Budd. Thank you, David. I really appreciate the introduction, the kind words, and again, for hosting me this morning. Um, you know, I came across Heritage uh, Foundation uh, mission statement last night, and I thought it was appropriate to lead off my remarks with those uh, this morning. It is building an America where freedom, opportunity, prosperity, and civil society flourish. 
So I appreciate all that you and the, the staff here at Heritage do to accomplish a very worthy and very notable goal. So I also want to thank our distinguished panelists that will be up here in just a moment. It was good chatting with you a little bit earlier and uh, even learning more about uh, this football that I'm carrying here. So um, I also want to thank those of you in the audience that are here today and those of you who are joining us online. Uh, we have uh, a little bit of an inside joke when we deliver a, a speech, which is mostly watched by C-SPAN, that at any given time, literally tens of people are watching. So I want to maybe we'll top that today. There's a good chance of it. So I want to start this morning by addressing the problem that I am trying to solve with my legislation H.R. 6127, the Unlocking Capital for Small Business Act. Currently, federal law prohibits engaging in the business of effecting transactions in securities without registering as a broker-dealer. This definition has a number of components, but the SEC has determined that a key feature of the broker-dealer is the receipt of so-called transaction-based compensation. In essence, that's really just a commission it, when it's in connection with buying or, or selling securities. The standard applied by the SEC has changed over the years. Occasionally, one instance of transaction-based compensation has been permissible without registration. While at times, any instance of this type has been considered to trigger the registration requirement. The licensing requirements are numerous, onerous, and highly costly. The American Bar Association has estimated that the legal, accounting, and compliance-related costs of initial registration can exceed $150,000, while annual compliance costs can be in the $75,000 to $100,000 range. These standards are okay for those who are engaged in the business of buying and selling securities, but for those who facilitate securities transactions only incidentally, they present serious difficulties. For example, let's consider a commonly Main Street example, uh, transaction to explain the, the problem that we're really trying to solve. So in this real world scenario, I want you to imagine a baker who would likely solicit investors to acquire $100,000 worth of capital through an issue of securities to expand to a second location. If the baker talks to a local real estate professional to solicit investors for him, it is likely against SEC regulations for that the real estate professional to find capital on a commission basis. Other sources of capital, such as angel investors or venture capital funds, are unlikely to even be interested in a transaction due to its small size and are difficult to access or to access in many areas of the country. It makes it hard to find there. That's the problem that we're trying to solve for the baker. And uh, in an example of new capital that we're trying to facilitate for small businesses. So I get a call this morning as I'm, I'm looking over my notes from uh, a friend in Florida who owns a flooring business. And he's just checking in as we get cranked back up here in September. And he said, I tell him what we're working on here today over at Heritage. And he says, I like that. I guess you're earning your paycheck. So it's good to hear from another small business person and friend um, that this is valuable to the marketplace. A 2005 report from the American Bar Association warned of a vast and pervasive gray market for brokerage activity. On the other hand, when gray market transactions are discovered, the consequences for both the issuer and the finder can be severe. For instance, in the case of Neogenics Corporation, the SEC found that the company to have used unregistered broker-dealers to find capital. This created a right of rescission for its investors, a right in which, in turn, destroyed the ability of the company to raise future capital by making the accounting for liabilities very difficult. Neogenics later, discovered, or later declared bankruptcy, and other issuers have had very similar problems to this. You know, back, uh, I understand that uh, the guidance was uh, withdrawn around 2000 that has really created this problem. So in the year 2000, since there's been an 18-year period. So early 2000s, I was helping a friend try to raise capital. It was actually for a film project on the West Coast. And uh, while we had a PPM, or a private placement memorandum, uh, ready to go, our network at the time, 18 years ago, was only so big. But we had other people, other folks that knew a guy who knew a guy. And uh, we were unable to use those because it was in that gray market and very dangerous area. That, uh, uh, but we ended, up, uh, we ended up moving on from that, uh, that project. But at the same time, it would have been very, very helpful to have had this guidance and been able to use um, people to help raise capital like this. So we really have a problem, but uh, we think we, we can fix this through HR 6127. 
A bill does this. It creates two safe harbors within the State Security Exchange Act in order to facilitate capital formation and increase economic dynamism. First, it creates a finder safe harbor. A finder safe harbor. This is a limited exemption from registration requirements for those individuals who are only incidentally engaged in the business of finding capital. The goal is to allow two Main Street business people to strike a deal to find capital on a commission basis without undue regulatory interference. Compensation limits, overall security value limits, and the number of offerings limitations restrict this exemption to those engaged incidentally in the business of finding capital. Secondly, my legislation creates a private placement broker safe harbor for those that are engaged in the business of finding capital, but who do not actually buy or sell securities on behalf of clients. The bill creates a relaxed but clear standard for registration. So I think it's worth noting that the ideas found in H.R. 6127 are hardly extreme, or are hardly even new. For example, the SEC Government Business Forum on Small Business Capital Formation recommends allowing intermittent or small, small finders to be exempt from registration as broker-dealers. Furthermore, their report recommends implementing the principles of the American Bar Association Tax Force on private placement brokers, principles that my bill is crafted to fulfill. These recommendations have been perennially included in the SEC government business forum reports, stretching back more than a decade. The 2003 forum rated resolving the finder's uh, issue as number one recommendation. Updating the law in response to these recommendations is long overdue. H.R. 6127 represents a common sense solution to a perennial problem in securities regulation, and if passed into law, would substantially increase capital formation by making finders safe, secure, and convenient for use by issuers. Finally, I'd be remiss if I did not tie in H.R. 6127 into all that we've been doing on the House Financial Services Committee to help facilitate capital formation. Under the conservative leadership of Chairman Jeb Henserling and Capital Markets Subcommittee Chairman Bill Huizenga, we have seen a host of legislation get rolled into this jobs uh, package that will facilitate capital formation. Dodd-Frank brought with it regulatory complexity that produced a less resilient financial system and stifled economic growth. As a result, small and mid-sized firms are having, have had a harder time obtaining access to the equity capital they need. Thankfully, the JOBS Act is an important step, particularly for small and emerging companies in helping facilitate capital formation. Bills like H.R. 6127 fall into this capital formation category directly benefits small and emerging companies. And I think it should go without saying that it would be a great win to get this legislation signed into law. So I'll close with a simple thank you to all of you attending and watching this event online. And thank you again, David. And I also appreciate your interest in capital formation. We've got a great group of panelists here and I appreciate you again for coming. And it's been a goal of uh, my committee and I think we have made great strides in this area over the 115th Congress. And with that, I can take just a few questions. Um, we have a microphone, and if you would just uh, say your name and, and institutional affiliation if you have a question. Sorry. Uh, Philip Todd with the, at the Mercatus Center. Uh, I'm just curious, what would the implications be for equity-based uh, crowdfunding or crowdsourcing uh, uh, services with this bill? Oh, I knew they would always be so smart. It reminds me of the time when uh, in football practice, the coach said, son, if there's a fumble, you just fall on that ball. Don't ever run with it. All right. So you've asked me a question I'm going to leave for our panelists, um, and we're, we'll get to that better. So thank you, Philip. Appreciate that. All right. Linda. Linda Lerner. Thank you, I Linda. am the current chair of the American Bar Association Task Force on Private Placement Brokers, mm -hmm. which Faith chaired for many years, and Martin another panelist has, has also chaired. On behalf of all of us who have worked for decades on this problem, and on behalf of the business brokers and capital finders across America, I want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Right. I have no question. Right. Just thank you. Absolutely. It's a real honor to be able to do this, Linda. I'm very excited. As somebody who has more small business in me than I do politics, I uh, really appreciate that. And um, I'm helping folks... Uh, uh, like I've grown up and around, and uh, I think this is good, good for our economy. One of the things, Linda, I heard uh, yesterday, I was with uh, in, in a uh, 
meeting with bank, about bank regulation uh, since I'm on the Financial Services Committee. So at the table were the Fed, the SEC, the OCC, and uh, FASB for uh, accounting standards. And they really pressed the fact that um, growth indicators are leading indicators, and that is risk taking. And so these are the risk takers that we're trying to help, the people that drive our economy. And so we want to do all we can to reduce friction in the economy and while providing some safety as well. So we think that's what this does. Really appreciate that, Linda. Thank you. Hi, Lydia Mashburn with the Cato Institute. Um, what are the prospects for the bill's passage, particularly in the Senate, and especially what kind of support are you getting from um, uh, the Democratic caucuses? And what are some of the major objections you're finding to folks who aren't as keen to open up these um, opportunities to more uh, businesses and uh, investors? Lydia, I think the answer lies in the timing. Uh, so some good news is Senator Tillis has agreed to introduce this on the Senate side. So very good. He's got a good banking team with him over there. He's a fellow North Carolinian with me. Um, so I think that's good. Now, timing get it being that it's getting closer and closer to November, um, uh, the collegial spirit tends to fade away until uh, the lame duck session. Uh, a lot of, if you look at my history, a lot of the bills that I've done, capital formation bills, have been uh, with Democrats and reached across the aisle. Uh, they're not partisan related issues. Now, simply because there is an election looming, um, there does seem to, seem to be much more of a partisan spirit. Um, so uh, we would like to reach across the aisle on this one. We are certainly willing to. Whether we have that reciprocity, I don't know yet. But I do know on the Senate there's good hopes. But that's one of the reasons why I looked at um, the 116th Congress, where there's great hopes there. I think, it could, I think it could get traction regardless of the makeup in the House or the Senate. Thank you. All right, really appreciate your time. Thank you again. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, thank you, Dave. All right. Appreciate your willingness to, to join us. All right, we will now have our, our panel. Um, and we have Faith Polish, Aaron Kerrigan, and Martin Hewitt. Give them about a few seconds to get up up here. Each of our panelists is going to make approximately an eight or ten minute presentation, and then we'll have audience Q and A. And I may ask a few questions if I think there's something they haven't raised. Uh, let me start by introducing Faith. Uh, Faith uh, has been a, a leader in this area for a long time. She is counsel at Carter Ledger in Milburn. She's been at the forefront of the effort to promote a more rational uh, regulatory system governing finders and private placement brokers since at least 1999. Uh, she was one of the initial members and for some time chairman of the ABA Task Force on Private Placement Brokers. Uh, she uh, participated in the drafting of the task force report in 2005, and alas, uh, that report is still highly relevant reading because not a great deal has changed on the regu regulatory front since then. Um, <clears throat> in uh, late 2013, at the invitation of the chief counsel of the then, uh, uh, or then chief counsel of the SEC Division of Trading and Markets, she and a small team of lawyers uh, requested a no-action letter uh, for M&A finders or business brokers, uh, which has helped address problems in that area considerably. I think Martin was heavily involved in that, and probably Linda, too. Uh, uh, and so this is sort of the other half of that. Uh, she is, has served on numerous advisory boards and com committees, including the NASD, back when there was an NS NASD uh, regulatory function, their legal advisory board, the uh, NASDAQ Market Operations Review Committee, NASD Committee to Review the Use of Form U5, and the NASD, NASD Admissions Review Committee. She's a graduate of Columbia University Law School, uh, worked for the SEC for a while, but most of her practice has been in private practice in New York City. Karen Kerrigan is president of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council uh, for approximately 25 years. Karen and I have known each other 
longer than I think either of us would care to admit. Uh, <laughs> But she is one of the most effective advocates for small businesses in Washington. And uh, uh, her group is, pro I think it's fair to say, the most active small business group on entrepreneurial capital formation issues. Um, she is also a board member and former chairperson of the Center for International Private Enterprise, which is one of the constituent parts of the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, and she's also a founding member of the World Entrepreneurship Council. She uh, has a degree in political science from the State University of New York at Cortland. Uh, Martin Hewitt, <laughs> Wait. Martin was late getting me his bio, so I drafted a bio for him and threatened to, to use that instead of what, what he sent me. So, and that resulted in him sending me a bio. <laughs> um, but Martin is an attorney in private practice in New Jersey. Uh, he is the past and incoming chair of the American Bar Association's Committee on State Regulation of Securities, i.e. Blue Sky Laws, and the past chair and current vice chair of the ABA's Task Force on Private Placement Brokers, our subject today. Uh, he was, uh, as I mentioned, very involved in the business broker no action letter. Uh, Congress, I mean, excuse me, uh, Martin, uh, Went and got crazy and ran for Congress last time around, uh, but uh, alas, fell short. And uh, and uh, he also uh, asked me to mention that he is a marathon runner, which raises the almost irrebuttable presumption that he's crazy. To anybody who runs twenty six miles, uh, and uh, and and a violinist. So. Uh, I, the, we're going to go in the order that, that folks are on the dais. I think that uh, you will get a great deal of very useful information about this important issue. I suppose one, one just last thought. This issue sounds like it's highly technical and, you know, sort of a, an incredibly nerdy issue. But this issue matters a tremendous amount to helping small businesses in Main Street America find capital uh, because broker dealers generally aren't going to be interested in, in some small business in Peoria. And in Peoria or North Carolina or wherever, there are just aren't that many people running around that make $300,000 a year. And so they need help finding accredited investors. So this issue is important all out of proportion to what it seems in terms of helping entrepreneurs in middle America find the capital that they need. Thank you. Very happy to be with you here today. And uh, I've been asked to sort of review what has led up to where we are now, both uh, in, a regula in the regulatory area and, uh, and obviously in Congress. S and a lot of that has already been covered by Congressman Budd. But let me just quickly give you an overview. But I have to start off by saying that uh, I have been the chair of the ABA task force. I've been a member of it since its inception. I have been associated with many other organizations over my lifetime and still am. But I'm speaking now for myself. And my our guest who works for the SEC will understand that it's a standard disclaimer that the views that I express, although I think they've had an impact elsewhere. And I certainly have learned from the people I've worked with that these are my, my views. Uh, so we, we've heard about the problems that came to a head in around 2000 or 99, but that was preceded by a number of important pronouncements from the SEC. Uh, you all know what a no action letter is. It's a letter from the staff saying, if you do what you say you're going to do, we, the staff, will not recommend that the commission bring enforcement action. It's not, it's not a, an exemptive order. It's not a interpretation of a statute is the staff position of policy. But it's very widely respected, and many courts follow it, and a lot of lawyers treat it as if it were black letter law. So there was this very nice no action letter going back to 1985, the Dominion Resources uh, letter that uh, David mentioned. And there was also another rather nice no-action letter issued to IBEC, which was essentially focusing on the M&A aspect of the business. 
And then there was the very famous Paul Anka letter. Paul Anka, the famous singer, in 1991, was asked to raise money for a hockey team in Canada. And all he was going to do was give his Rolodex to the people who were actually promoting that fundraising. And the SEC said that would be OK, and he could be paid based on money raised. But then there were a couple of not so nice things that happened, at least in terms of ability of finders to operate. One was an SEC, a Supreme Court decision in 1985, the Landreth Timber case, which held that when you're selling 100% of the stock of a company, which some people regarded as a sale of a business, it was nevertheless a securities transaction subject to all of the securities laws, including registration of securities and registration requirements for the intermediary. So that was a real monkey wrench in the gears for the M&A business. And then you had this, I would almost say mysterious, or certainly not well explained, withdrawal of the Dominion Resources letter in 2000. The rationale was things have changed, and therefore we no longer have the same point of view. So that took us up to around 2000. And while we were all worrying about Y2K and if our computers would all crash, um, you may remember there was a tech bubble on the West Coast and around that time. And there were issuers who were trying to raise money with no track record, with no capital, with no inventory, with no nothing, but an idea. And their lawyers, mainly in California, were very concerned about how they were going to raise money with no broker dealers would be interested in them. And so they were starting to use unregistered finders as, as intermediaries. And the lawyers who were essentially, um, how should I say, 33 Act lawyers, they were concerned about the, cap, the, the issuance of securities by issuers, were concerned that their clients were exposed to what I call the R word, the scariest word in the vocabulary, rescission. Because without fraud, without any other malfeasance, if you use an unregistered broker to raise money, your transaction is, is, is vulnerable to rescission by the investors. If they just decide they don't like it, if things don't go as well as they hoped, they are entitled to get their money back. And uh, so that's what was the genesis of the task force. And since these lawyers were essentially 33 Act lawyers, they thought it would be a good idea to have someone on board who knew a little bit about broker-dealer regulation, and that's when I joined them. I had occasion to reread the task force report just within the last 24 hours. And I have to tell you, it really holds up. There are some things in there that are a little bit antique. But I would say 98% of it is as true today as the day it was written. And, um, and I, I really encourage people who have any interest in this to read it. It's, it's, it's readable. Uh, when it came out, uh, it was endorsed by an SEC advisory committee on the subject, which said the SEC should spearhead a program to implement the recommendations of the task force. And every year since then, the annual small business conference has recommended that the SEC proceed to, to, to recognize the importance of these recommendations and do something about it. Um, uh, so, so that takes us up to the time the task force came out, uh, task force report came out. There have been some interesting developments since then, which of course aren't reflected in the task force report. There have been a number of denials of no action relief. There have been a couple of favorable actions, including the M&A broker letter that uh, David mentioned. I can, I think I can tell you, and if not, I'm going to tell you anyhow. Uh, the 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 impetus for requesting that no action letter was that there was a bill in Congress, which I believe is largely replicated in the current uh, Jobs 3.0 package, which would have provided an exemption, which may yet provide an exemption for MNA finders. And the SEC staff were not enthusiastic about how it was drafted, and so they thought they might accomplish a similar result by a, a no action letter. And that's how that no action letter came to be. Um, uh, so there were a couple of other positive uh, uh, 
pronouncements by the SEC. There were, uh, in 2013, there were no action letters to the Angel List and Funders Club, which are both sort of relying on the fact that the people involved were or were be becoming registered investment advisors, so the SEC would have some oversight of these people anyhow, and they were only dealing with very rich investors. But nothing that really goes to the problem that David and the congressman have have identified, which is small businesses trying to raise small amounts of money in areas where you don't have a lot of professional support. And believe me, I've attended almost all of the uh, small business conferences uh, in the last 10 years. And at every one of them, there's some member of the public who says, please help us. We cannot get a broker dealer to answer our calls. It isn't worth their time. They understand why the broker dealers are not calling them back because for a broker dealer to do the job properly, you have to have a critical mass of money to be raised so you can make an appropriate fee. And these deals are just too small. So this is not going to break the rice bowl of anybody that's a thin member. And if they think they would rather have this lighter kind of regulation, they can certainly opt into it. Um, but uh, it, it, it's, it, it's two different worlds. Uh, there have also been a couple of interesting court decisions. There have been a number of uh, interesting court decisions, but two in particular that stick in my mind. One was in 2011 in Florida. The SEC brought an action against a bunch of people, including a Mr. Kramer, who had raised money for an operation which turned out to be a, um, a fraud. Uh, and uh, he was not registered. And the court there said that what he had done, and when I read the decision, and I always read the, you know, you look at the facts. I mean, that's, that's what lawyers do. You look at the facts. And I said, this guy was a, he was a broker. He was paid to talk to people about why this was a good investment, and he got paid based on the fact that they invested. So I, I couldn't believe it that the court held that he wasn't a broker and the SEC lost and did not appeal that decision. There was an equally, to me, bizarre decision in Texas involving a company called, uh, it's got initials, but the key figure in that was a Mr. Paxton, who I believe is still the Attorney General of the state of Texas, and who was not registered as a broker and who assisted people in raising money. And frankly, I don't know how the court could have come to that decision based on those facts. So you have, you have things going both ways. And it's one of the things that the task force had asked the SEC to do and keeps asking the SEC to do is whatever rule you want to adopt or whatever policy you want to enunciate, please come out with a clear statement of what is your policy. Uh, you know, we'll give you a list of scenarios, and you can tell us whether you think they're okay or not okay, and it's been very difficult to get any kind of response. Uh, I would just want to very quickly mention a couple of things that have been done that are different from this bill, but are, I think, positive indications of the ability of people to think outside the box. One of them, obviously, is crowdfunding, which is a very different process, and to some extent, it, it would be in coordination with this kind of finder um, uh, relief. And also, FINRA has adopted a rule called CAB, which stands for Capital Appreciation Broker, which is a lighter kind of, they're registered with the SEC, they are FINRA members, they have exemptions from a number of FINRA rules, but they can only raise money from people that are institutions, which is not only in, uh, accredited, but in FINRA definition, an institution has to have at least $50 million. So this is not going to help small business. There's a lot more to be said, but I, I think I've overrun my time. Um, let me just uh, mention two things before we go to Karen. First off, uh, my paper on this subject is outside uh, available, and it's also available on the internet. It's called Let Entrepreneurs Raise Capital Using Finders and Private Placement Brokers. But more relevantly, the ABA Task Force report and a link to it is uh, in footnote one, if anybody's interested in, in reading the uh, ABA Task Force report. Karen. Great. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, thank you, David, for inviting me and SBE Council to be part of the panel. And 
Thank you for your long-term leadership and work on this, on all these issues. Uh, um, uh, capital access uh, is, um, well, my members are certainly appreciative of all the work that you do. We are, and um, it's making a big difference for entrepreneurship uh, and small businesses. We also would like to thank um, the congressman for introducing uh, this legislation, the Unlocking Capital for Small Businesses Act. Um, it's actually something that will do what the title says it will, <laughs> and uh, which we're very, very uh, excited about. So um, SB Council, we, um, we're an advocacy research and education organization. We've been around for uh, nearly 25 years. We have 100,000 members throughout the country. And um, access to capital has been an enduring challenge um, for our members. Um, many of our uh, young startups, uh, those existing businesses that want to grow, um, certainly uh, the challenges are more acute um, when there's economic downturns, when you have a financial crisis, great recession, um, uh, et cetera. Um, but the, um, the bottom line is that the um, uh, unnecessarily rules and regulation, red tape, um, outdated regulation, inappropriate regulation um, is creating uh, tremendous barriers uh, to, uh, to capital access. And, um, but uh, we see a, a lot of great uh, positive movement uh, in this regard, certainly uh, starting with uh, the executive orders that uh, were signed by uh, President Trump and um, a lot of the recommendations and, and meaningful action that are starting to make a difference. Uh, the gears are in motion at the Securities and Exchange Commission, and there's been some uh, good action uh, coming from the SEC, and we anticipate more. And then, of course, uh, the Congress. There's um, uh, the, the uh, leadership of Chairman Henserling um, and his passion in stewarding uh, this Jobs Act 3.0 bill um, through the House, and, and gosh, we're working like crazy uh, to try to get uh, some uh, movement going or get it through the Senate uh, into the President's desk because it will make uh, a meaningful difference um, for, for small businesses. Um, the unlocking uh, 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 Capital Access for Small Businesses Act is another key piece um, of, of the puzzle. And just from our perspective and from a layman's perspective, I, I don't, I'm not a securities lawyer, I have no expertise, but it just, from our perspective, it just makes uh, a lot of common sense to have clarity um, uh, in the law and, and rules that allow people who are connected uh, to small business and their networks to um, uh, make connections and introductions to those who can uh, fund their businesses. Uh, this is becoming more and more important. Well, as I said, access to capital is an enduring challenge, um, but now uh, you've got tremendous growth uh, in the economy. Uh, you have um, entrepreneurs who are uh, looking for expansion capital, growth capital to take advantage of these growth opportunities. You also have more people who want to start businesses. Uh, we've had uh, entrepreneurship has been very, very weak um, over the past decade or more. Uh, in, in research that we put out in 2016, um, because of the lack of entrepreneurship over, um, uh, over uh, the last 10 years or more, we have about 3.4 million missing businesses in our economy, meaning people who have not started businesses because of uh, either weak economic conditions, because of lack of access to capital. So you do have more people interested in starting businesses. There's more, uh, obviously there's economic momentum. There's growth in the economy, but in all of these instances, you do need um, access to capital. Um, so again, HR 6127 makes perfect sense from our, uh, in our, uh, from our perspective. Uh, we support the bill. I told the congressman we're going to get up a, a letter, uh, you know, to officially endorse the legislation. The only regret that I have is it wasn't introduced earlier, so we could, you know, fold it in uh, to Jobs Act 3.0. Um, but it, it is an important piece of legislation. It, it provides, um, as uh, outlined by the congressman, a common sense uh, approach to regulation and regulatory compliance. Um, it's a scaled approach, 
and which is always important uh, for the entrepreneurial and small business sector of the economy, as one size uh, fits all regulation is uh, never uh, appropriate um, uh, for regulatory regimes, and that is uh, certainly uh, the case uh, in this area. It, um, the bill will also help to reduce uh, the cost of raising capital uh, and allows entrepreneurs to more easily work with individuals, those finders um, who have strong accredit accredited investor networks. Um, and as uh, David said, for the most part, most small businesses, uh, most small business people do not have access to affluent accredited investors. So this will enable uh, those connections. So in effect, um, the legislation would help to open up uh, networks, make better use of them, uh, meaning networks and relationships will be more effective and more efficient, uh, again, by allowing, especially by allowing um, uh, more individuals to make introductions to those who could possibly become investors in a startup or a promising business. So in my view, it's always a good thing when individuals are helping entrepreneurs find the capital uh, they need to start up and grow a business. And the Unlocking uh, Capital for Small Businesses Act will enable that. And, um, and we'll be working uh, with the congressman uh, and his staff to get the sponsors it needs and get some momentum behind this legislation. Um, because it is an important uh, piece, again, of the, of the puzzle to help um, entrepreneurs everywhere. So thank you. Next is Martin. But Martin, um, if at some point in your remarks you could talk a little bit about the interaction between the federal rules and the state rules and how, uh, the, you know, some states have enacted uh, laws designed to help address this problem, but ultimately it, until the federal government gets its act together, they're limited. Absolutely. Uh, I was planning on it. First of all, I want to thank you for the invite. I also want to thank the congressman for his efforts. And um, let me just launch into a, a few things. First of all, I want to go back to something that Faith mentioned regarding uh, Paul Anka and a Rolodex. For those of you who may be too young, and there are a few in the room who may not understand, a Rolodex is an old-fashioned address book on the computer. So just so you understand that. I have one that sits on my desk. I know I've seen it, but there are very few of them left. <laughs> Anyhow, you know, we, we, we talk in gen general terms, we talk about, about um, uh, finders, but it's always sort of in a vacuum and never the impact it could have. And I'll give you a real life personal example. Many decades ago, uh, when there was CompuServe in the beginning of the internet, I had this strange idea, wouldn't it be great if I could form a company that would sell compact discs back then, on, in the electronic shopping mall of CompuServe online. You wouldn't have to have a physical plant. You wouldn't have to carry inventory. Just as people bought, you'd ship them out from the distributors. The problem was I couldn't find anyone to invest. Fast forward, and what is that today? The beginning of Amazon, basically. So it's a shame when somebody has an idea and can't uh, raise the funds for it. Uh, that, that's a little painful, and for me, on a personal level. So that's the one thing I wanted to bring attention is that there are real world personal consequences for all of these uh, things. And, and you know, there are two laws that always exist and that's, that's Murphy's Law and the Law of Unintended Consequences. And one of the things that I think the SEC and the states have been nervous about is, well, if we, if we regulate these finders, then, then you know, uh, we, we, we could be in trouble for those who go rogue, not understanding that when they don't do anything, and in fact, there are a few nefarious finders out there, the, regul the regulators, the legislators, everyone will be called to task, why didn't we do something? And we've been trying to do that for years. Now, just to look at the uh, M&A no action letter, what that did was spurred some states to actually do something. And even that was a very limited pool of states that actually enacted any r rules, statute, whatever. Of those states, there are, there are 13 states and five of them actually clung to the no action letter and said, this is what we want to do. But until the no action letter, they weren't doing anything. It was the no action letter that got the states, other states or NASA to create a model rule that the other seven states had, have, uh, have enacted to some extent or another. Understanding that any uniform rule is seldom uniform but gives those of us who practice in this area of state securities laws a very good living. So, you know, we have to look at now looking at finders specifically. 
On the state level, there have only been seven states that have actually had anything to say, uh, going from California in great detail. And my favorite is Minnesota, which has, uh, has this to say, basically, and I'm, I think I'm paraphrasing here. Um, let me just find it. Uh, one second. It's kind of, uh, it's amusing to me because what Nebraska has said is Nebraska interprets finder's fees as commissions and therefore may only be re paid to a registered agent of a registered broker dealer. In other words, they're saying nothing at all. Now, some states may be taking the view that it doesn't have any particular impact on their citizens, but I don't think that's it. I think what they need is urging from, this, from the federal level, whether it's SEC or Congress, because it looks like Congress is going to be the one to hopefully take action on this. Uh, to actually move the ball forward. The fact is there are, there are three groups that we have to worry about when it comes to finders. Uh, nefarious groups, we'll call them. The first is nefarious finders who actually are ripping off unsuspecting uh, uh, issuers. Uh, on the other hand, you have issuers who are engaging finders who provide a valuable service and are saying, well, you know what? We don't have to pay you because it's an illegal contract, and they are they're being nefarious to the finder. And then you've got the investor who's trying to make a killing at all costs, and it gets upset when they lose money. Now that doesn't mean I'm not an, that I'm anti-investor protection, but what that means is we have to take a look at may, perhaps redefining our terms. There is capital formation on one side, and they've always said investor protection on the other, but it really should be investor empowerment. And as the rules, such as they are or are not at the moment, that's seldom addressed. So I'm going a little bit afield, but understanding that it all loops back to the fact that we need a system in place, and I think the bill does a, a great job uh, of, of, of addressing it, and will hopefully uh, get the states to then uh, understand that they need a regime. Now, there are those who will say that the states really have no business in regulating any issuer or any broker-dealer, and they should be in enforcement only. Um, my own personal opinion, I'll keep to myself, but the fact is we do have to find a system where you do not have um, 50 states with absolutely no direction and six states with very limited direction as to what a finder can do. It paralyzes lawyers advising them as to what they can do in the future or what they can do presently, and it also paralyzes the issuers. Um, the argument from broker-dealers, whether federally or state, uh, level to say, well, you know, this is infringing on our territory. The fact is, these 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 uh, small companies, whether it was the one I was thinking of, where I was just trying to raise a hundred thousand dollars back in 1982 or three, uh, to now, that's that's uh, small peanuts to, to to broker dealers and investment banks, and they really have no reason to be particularly worried about that. They may want to be courting them and helping establish finders in that when the when a company grows to a sufficient level, well, they will have already established a relationship, perhaps, with the small company as it grows. So I would hope that at some point, we could perhaps um, get a meeting of the minds with larger underwriters, broker-dealers, investment bankers, explaining that what we're doing today with finders only helps them down the road. And the other thing is, this is something I <coughs> spoke about a lot when I was, <coughs> excuse me, running for Congress, which is, it's neither a Democratic nor Republican problem or issue. The fact is finders and small company startups are of both stripes and everything in between and unaffiliated. And the fact is small companies touch on, uh, you know, not just somebody sitting in their garage up in Cambridge, Massachusetts or elsewhere in, in, in Palo Alto, but, but you know, in mid-America, where you have a lot of people with ideas from various backgrounds, ethnicities, et cetera, who don't understand that they want to start a business. They go to a bank and there's absolutely no money at the bank. They think they're done, that there's no place to go to. So part of what we have to do as we're developing this, well, developing has been going on for 20 years, I would say, uh, or longer, what we have to do is develop uh, a system of education for those people who want finders and for people who want to act as finders to understand exactly what the possibilities are because as we talk about finders in a limited legal capacity or talking about regulation generally, we sometimes don't understand the impact it'll have at the local level. You know, not only does it help the small company, but as it grows, they can hire people at the local level and therefore it's, it's a major source of employment in small towns and could be in small towns all across America. So I think what one of the things I wanted to bring home today on this whole subject is the fact that finders it has to be a coordinated 
effort on the part of the SEC, uh, Congress, and the states to come up with some mechanism whereby people can actually rely on something that's concrete, also known as law, as opposed to just a no action letter, which as was stated earlier, can be taken away and no one knows what the hell to do next. So that's a very brief, uh, pres my presentation, and if people have questions, I'd love to hear them. Right, let me just take uh, 60 seconds and, and sort of explain the structure of the, the legislation in, in a little more detail that Congressman Budd has introduced. And, but it's really fairly straightforward. There is a general requirement that broker-dealers register with the SEC, and they're registered by both the SEC and FINRA. Uh, the bill exempts very small and intermittent uh, finders that simply make introductions. There's a series of requirements. And, and definitions saying what, what that is. And then it, it, it establishes uh, a lighter registration regime uh, for private placement brokers, people who are basically in the business of being finders, uh, and uh, sets forth a series of rules governing that. So it is a scaled registration regime, an outright exemption for, say, a, a Main Street business colleague that makes a few introductions that results in investments, a light registration regime, light compared to broker-dealer regulation. Um, and uh, then if you actually are a broker-dealer, of course, you have to register as, as a broker-dealer. Uh, um, do I, th either uh, Faith or Karen want to say anything else? And then we'll get to audience questions. Um, I have been referred to as the outspoken man. Ms. Kolish, because I have never been outspoken by anybody. So I have a lot to say, but I think I'd like to hear the questions. Okay. Uh, audience questions, and uh, f feel free to, to, to ask questions of as detailed as, as you would like. Um, if you have questions, please say your name and institutional affiliation. And I think there's a mic running around, at least there was. Um, anybody? Okay. While you're waiting for questions, I just want to point out, as, as we're trying to explain up here, it sounds like it might be hyper-technical, but at the end of the day, it's really very simple, trying to make sure that, that entrepreneurs have access to capital and how we do that in a, in a way that both encourages that investment while making sure that there are sufficient safeguards for all involved. It's basically that simple. I would like to make one observation, or I'll start off with one, uh, that this legislation, when it's, in, when it's enacted, when it's been signed by the president, which of course will take time, will require the SEC to adopt rules. It will have 120 days unless something's changed in the bill to adopt rules for the registration of private placement brokers and also to adopt rules or otherwise give direction to FINRA for FINRA to adopt rules for how to, in, how to um, incorporate these new types of brokers into their membership. So that's a process which, and I know there's a time limit in the bill, and if that is the way it comes out in the eventual legislation, but the SEC, when they propose rules, put them out for comment. And there are comments, and there are possibly reproposals of rules. So what we're looking at is a process that easily could take at least a year. Uh, a year to me seems like a moment compared to the amount of time that's been invested in this already. But there will be an opportunity at the SEC level to fine tune this. This is not a bad bill. This is a very, very good bill. But it doesn't deal with all of the minutia that you would find in a rule. So for example, if you looked at the statute that in, in, it authorized crowdfunding, and then you take a look at the crowdfunding rules, both at the SEC level and the FINRA level, there's just a lot more detail about how you get in, and what you do when you're in, and what they can do to you, and what you can't do, and what you may do, and what you must do. And all of that is still potentially to be refined uh, at, at another stage. It's, it's, this is not the end of the process. Yeah, um, the 
private place of the registration regime, of course, the SEC will write rules and, and all that. The exemption for small and intermittent finders is self-effectuated, which is important. Right. You're absolutely uh, right. So that, as that soon as it's passed, we're good to go for the, the exactly. smallest finders, the exactly. sort of Main Street business guy helping a Main Street business right. guy. Linda. Just to add to this conversation, in approximately 2006, we worked on a trap that'll take place for the MBC. Here's, here's a mic coming right, right here. In approximately 2006, we worked on a draft set of rules which would fit the bill pretty well. They were submitted. We've still got them around. So when the time comes, call on us. Great. Any other questions? All right. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. i uh, also like to say, for those of you watching on the Internet, uh, the uh, actual film edited for sound levels and things like that will be available on our website starting in about 24 hours. And feel free to send the link to anybody you think would be interested in, in this subject so that uh, people can, can watch and become more informed about uh, the issue. Thanks again. Have a good day.